I think we're having some slight technical issues with Charlotte's sound. Nothing. <laughs> Is your how's your volume doing on your on your computer? Is that any better? That is, we can hear you. Yes. Perfect. It was the headset. It there was we go. Perfect. Perfect. Sorry about that, everybody. We did check the audio visuals before we started, so um, alas, we can't prepare for everything. So my name's Charlotte Bonner, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm the Unity's program manager in the US Sustainability Team. So the National Union students have uh, a sustainability team of 25 people who are working to realise uh, our goal of students really being at the heart um, of social change with regard to sustainability. And as a result of that, we do a lot of work across the tertiary education sector and beyond to provide students with great opportunities to engage with the sustainability agenda and to really drive the sustainability agenda forward. And this year, we've been working with Love to Ride, and Jack will introduce them in just a second, as well as the EAUC to help um, understand how we can work with institutions um, to really get more staff and students riding the bike. Um, Jack, do I introduce uh, you and Dr. Wright? Thanks a lot, Charlotte. Yeah, I'm Jack. I'm Senior Projects Manager at Love to Ride, although in a previous life I spent 10 years in higher education, um, including a few years on the Transport Policy Group at the University of Sheffield. Um, and I've been overseeing the unicycle programme from Love to Ride's angle. Um, and was involved in setting up the partnership and um, what seems like a lifetime ago about 13 months ago now. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about Love to Ride specifically? Yeah certainly, um, so Love to Ride started about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we work overwhelmingly with local authorities um, through workplace engagement to get more people on bikes. Um, in that time, we've kind of refined our um, stock in trade, which is the Workplace Cycle Challenge, which is a friendly competition between workplaces to see which can get the most people to try riding a bike. Um, in the 10 years we've been delivering those, um, we have engaged with a lot of universities in the UK. Um, the University of York, for example, has had over a thousand staff take part. Um, so through that work, we cottoned on to the fact that there was a lot of potential in the sector to get more staff and students riding bikes. Uh, and that's, that's how we came um, about this partnership with the AUC and with NUS Sustainability. Uh, thanks, Jack. So what we're here to talk about today is the findings from the first year uh, of the programme. So, um, so we'll be um, giving you an overview of what that pilot has looked like, what methodologies we've used as well as um, what we've learned during that time uh, in advance of the final report being, being published shortly. We're also going to present four case studies from some of the pilot systems in terms of interventions that they've designed and delivered that have helped them um, get more staff and students on bicycles. And then we've got a section at the end, um, as Sophie um, alluded to, to have some Q&A, to debate anything, to discuss um, what we're going to be doing next with the programme. So I hope that's what you're expecting. I hope we brought you here on accurate frequencies. Um, and without further ado, we'll tell you a little bit about how um, the Unicycle Journey came about. Um, no puns intended with lots of journey uh, illusions. Jack, I think you're going to kick us off. Here. Absolutely, yeah. So as I've already said, really, we, we started a long time ago and have engaged a lot of universities um, in that time. Over the last few years, we've and brought our work into a kind of program of year-round activity. There's actually one ongoing at the moment. Uh, it's Bike Week, which we run in um, partnership with Cycling UK. So do have a look on lovetoride.net and sign up and take part in that. You can get a, a bit of a taste for what we do through that program. Um, like I say, we've engaged over 80 universities in the UK on our workplace programs, and they've been some of our best participating organizations. York's one example that I've cited. Um, but it, we've had winning organisations in our national programme cycle September um, from the sector, including the University of Sheffield, the University of Exeter, Edinburgh have also done very well in the past. Um, so, we, like I say, we knew that there was real potential in the sector. We um, ran a pilot programme with the bike station in Glasgow with all of the universities and colleges up there uh, in 2016. Uh, and then last year we approached um, NUS Sustainability and the EAUC to submit a joint bid to the Innovation Challenge Fund at the DFT um, to run a, a university specific programme. Um, that bid was successful. We then started the process of re recruiting universities to the pilot 
Um, I interviewed, I think, 28 institutions last year. There was really strong interest in, in taking part in the pilot. Um, six of those were registered um, with DFT subsidy. Um, we also opened it up to a couple on a completely self-funded basis to kind of prove the long-term viability of the programme. I'm very pleased to say that one of those, actually, the University of Oxford, went on to win the Unicycle Challenge this year uh, and have already signed up for next year. Um, so th that's how the um, institutions were recruited for the pilot programme. Oh. And then it was a case of working with each of those um, institutions to, to convene a working group, um, ideally with partners from across the institution and the student union um, and external um, partners where appropriate. So I know that a lot of the, the participants have done work with their local authorities, local um, bike shops, local training providers, for example, convening that group to look at exactly what the challenges around um, cycling are for that particular institution, um, as well as what the opportunities are. So as well as helping convene those working groups, we did a big scoping study. So we did um, some research into student attitudes um, and habits around cycling that would underpin <coughs> our methodology. And we also worked with um, Andrew Darnton, who's um, an independent researcher with a specialism in um, behavior change, and he invented um, the ISM model that we've used to frame the program and to help institutions understand the challenges that are specific to them and to plan interventions that will really help create an impactful step change. So, the first um, time we all came together was in November. We had um, a day exploring ISM, um, better understanding that technique, um, so that at plan interventions. From that point onwards, each of the institutions have been running their own events. Um, so they've ranged from um, small um, regular events, such as bike doctors, bike breakfasts, but also um, more, more um, logistical um, interventions. So for example, the University of Worcester's implemented a brand new um, e-bike hire scheme over the course of the program. And we'll go into some of those um, in a bit more detail later on. Alongside those local activities, um, we've been providing ongoing support, trying to share good practice and facilitate that networking between organizations. And um, we've been really, really beneficial um, in terms of love to rides experience and, and contacts, in terms of helping people overcome specific challenges or reach out to organisations local firm that can support the programme. And we've also um, delivered some national programmes as well. So alongside those individual interventions at each campus, we've run national competitions where using Love to Ride's um, platform, online platform, um, which helps log um, activity among cyclists, we've been able to um, deliver Cycle October, Winter Wheelers and the Unicycle Challenge, where staff and students are basically competing with each other internally, but also across the programme. Um, to see who, who's clocked up the mobiles and who's created the biggest step change. So a whole portfolio of activity over the course of the year. And now um, we're at the end of that pilot. We're just pulling together the final report um, using the monitoring and evaluation metrics that we've done nationally, but as well um, at a local level. And that's further informing um, our, our work for next year. So we're pulling together um, a program, a tiered program. So um, kind of a membership level program for, for organisations who who already are doing a lot of work on cycling, but want to be participating in, in this national network. Um, and then a really supportive program as well. Um, so we're just pulling together the final report to A, celebrate um, what we achieved, share our learnings, because obviously it's not always um, first time right, and we've learned a lot in terms of um, interventions, but also in terms of how to manage a program of this sort. And also to, to go back to the DFT and say that this is what six universities have achieved with your funding. We had two additional to that. But we know there's a lot of potential, so, so where next? Um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue our partnership with them in some way, shape or form. So that's how the, um, the programme's been delivered. Now I talked a little bit about um, the ISM model. I don't know whether anyone's familiar with this, but it was developed um, in 2011 by Andrew Darnton, um, who I've mentioned. And then it's been further revised a couple of times since then. And basically what he did was he did a really thorough literature review of um, behavior change and organizational change um, from uh, a sustainability perspective, but looking beyond that sustainability perspective to see, okay, well, how have other organizations, how have other sectors implemented um, behavior change historically, both successfully and unsuccessfully? 
And he also did a review of what was going on in practice. And the model that he developed to help then um, other organizations benefit from the good practice and the behavior change theory that was working was the ISM model. Now, ISM stands for Individual Social Material and can neatly be described as a head inside a circle, inside a box. Um, so it's a very visual tool that's, um, that's useful for both um, analyzing where you're currently at, but also de designing and devising um, change interventions that hopefully will be impactful. So this is the head inside the circle, inside the map. And I just thought I'd sh talk through with you one of the examples that we used at the ISM day back in November to help contextualize it for you and show how it can be used. So we used the people in the room. There was maybe 35 of us from the eight different participant universities, um, as well as some students, as well as some researchers, um, as well as the project team. And one of the things we talked about was specifically how to get students cycling regularly to campus. So using that particular um, behavior that we wanted to see, we used the ISM model to um, critique current practices, both in terms of what works well and what doesn't work well. And that helped us see where the big themes were across the participating universities, but also helped people see where the gaps were in their interventions. So it might be that a particular university had been doing absolutely lots around the material elements um, of that behavior, but less so on the social individual, for example. So just to go through them um, with that example in mind, like students cycling regularly to campus. Um, we talked about the individual elements that, that create behavior change and whether or not students identify um, with being a cyclist. So their beliefs, are, is cycling cool or is it not? Are their beliefs pro-environmental or not pro-environmental? Are they pro-fitness? Is that something that's important to them? Um, is, is, do they see cycling as a practical thing to do? So values and beliefs and attitudes about cycling in itself will help shape whether or not a student regularly cycles. Costs and benefits, there were quite high upfront costs for students. So when you get to campus, if you've not bought a bike with you, then going, you know, even, even a fairly relatively cheap bike seems like a big upfront cost. And especially because a lot of students immediately invest in a bus pass or a, um, a public transport pass early in their um, academic year. If they've already invested in their transport mechanism, they don't want to invest again um, in cycling. Having said that, there's obviously cost benefits. So on the long term, Cycling is relatively low cost, especially if you can access free maintenance um, as many students can. So there's pros and there's. But again, you can see how costs and benefits will help shape an individual's thoughts and therefore behaviours on, on cycling. Um, emotions, whether or not people are scared. People are generally scared about hills and roads. We see this in, our, in our, the research that we did. Some people feel um, scared about fitting in. You know, if I'm a cyclist, will I fit in with the... With, with the crowds and the people that I want to fit in with. Some people dislike sweating. There's all sorts of emotions that will feed into um, your thoughts about cycling. Agency, whether or not people have confidence to be um, regularly cycling. Skills, whether people have the navigation skills, the, the skills around bicycle security, the skills around cycling itself, um, all feed into whether or not um, a cyclist, a student will cycle regularly cycling. And habits, so if it's something that people do once a year, then all of the above, may be um, framed differently to an individual than if it's something that people are doing two or three times a day already. So you can start to see how all of those individual elements will have impact on behaviours um, in the cycling community. The social side, um, to go through a few of those to help you contextualise, so whether or not people identify as drivers or as cyclists in their community. And this will change between campuses and between universities. So you'll have some universities where there is a very strong identity generally amongst the student body of cycling, you know, it's, it's house is recognized um, nationally, you know, Oxford and Cambridge are, are cycling cities for students. In other campuses, um, very much the norm is that st students drive. And if that's the norm when students arrive, that's how they start to identify. Um, tastes, whether or not bikes are cool or not. And again, we talked a lot on the ISM day about, again, specific campus identities. So some some campuses, there was very much cool bikes that were in single speed, retrofitted, old school bicycles. Some um, campuses, that, no, our students think that the cool bikes are the really trashed old Dutch bikes with a basket. Um, so what, what, what's tasteful, what's cool, um, again, varies on a social level. 
And we talked about opinion leaders and the fact that there aren't many student opinion leaders that, that are um, promoting cycling or that identify um, visually with cycling. Um, networks, so whether people identify with cyclists as their friends or um, in the societies and clubs that they participate in. Um, the institutions that they are part of, so whether that's their university, the places they go for their nights out, the places they work, the places they live and whether or not cycling is something that is normalised within those institutions or not. Norms, this fear of missing out was quite a common theme at the ISM days. So do students not cycle because they don't want to be the only one not on the bus when all of their friends are on the bus? Um, so we talked around those kind of different social elements that again can help influence your behaviour or the students. And then finally, the square, the material elements. So infrastructure, does your halls of residence have a secure place to, to lock a bicycle? Does your house, if you live in the private um, rented sector, have space for a bicycle? Um, are the bus routes really convenient for you or are there, not, are there, are there decent um, quiet cycle routes available to you as, as a student to get to where you want to go? So the infrastructure is quite a big part of that. Um, objects, so you know, do you have um, availability of good affordable bicycles and security um, equipment, um, times and schedules. So there's an element of predictability with cycling. You know, you know how long it takes you to get from A to B. Um, so that helps with students. Um, but then there's other things like your weekend routine. A lot of students go home for the weekend. Does cycling fit in, in with that? Especially because that has an extra infrastructure requirement in terms of trains. Um, we talked about rules and regulations, about norms, about a lot of courses now requiring people to have a driving licence. So um, nursing students, midwifery students, um, teaching students that are going on placement. There is a norm, a rule in the, in the school that, that being able to drive is necessary, whereas there's not that necessary rule to be able to cycle. So how that impacts on people's um, behaviours. And then finally, the technologies. So what's available to people? Are cars available to people? Are buses available to people? Are bikes available to people? So you can start to see how on both an individual, a social and a material level, within the head, within the circle and within the box, um, these different elements really do impact on students' behaviours. And this is a good thing. You know, um, Andrew's worked with all sorts of organisations using ISM to look at drinking behaviours, looking at um, takeaway food behaviours. It's not necessarily just about cycling, but you can see how you can start to map what a behaviour is, what influences it, and what you're already doing as an institution to help um, those behaviours become more pro-cycling. So that's the methodology that we use. So at the ISM day in November, we did a big introductory session, we went through a couple of working examples. And then after that, um, that event, we worked with each of the institutions to go through a similar process to identify what their specific challenges were, and how they could design interventions that would start to improve some of these methodologies. The final thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about ISM is just some principles that um, we've learned about how to implement it well. And it works much better um, if you uh, are drawing on multiple contexts. So thinking about it's not just from, um, from your perspective as perhaps a, a travel planner or uh, somebody that works in the States or um, a residence manager um, looking at bicycle infrastructure, but looking at it from a student perspective, looking at it from the perspective of a part-time student with, um, with caring responsibilities, looking at it from a, um, the perspective of a student who has a job as well as their studies. Um, so drawing on different contexts, drawing on different perspectives and really involving different stakeholders in the mapping because your map might look very different from somebody else from within your institution's map. So using um, the actual methodology of ISM to bring together stakeholders to assess your situations and to get people's buy-in. Um, we found through um, NUS's behaviour change work that you can often get buy-in by just asking people's opinions. So bringing them together to say, we're really interested in your perspective on these issues and how as a collective we can improve this. The university has been really valuable in terms of one of our learnings about why ISM is a good methodology to use. So I think I've talked about ISM enough. I hope that's given you an introduction to, to the methodologies we've used um, through the pilot, um, but also why we chose this particular behaviour change model. And I'm now going to um, present a couple of case studies with Jack's help um, from four of the institutions who are taking part in the pilot this year. So the first one is um, the University of the West of England and their students' union. And their students' union particularly led on this intervention. 
they applied to the Insight Core Programme's microgrants um, programme. So we had some microgrants available to students and staff who wanted to implement interventions on their campus um, to develop a, um, a, a food tour on bikes. Um, so what they were looking to achieve was um, not just getting people comfortable with riding a bike in the local area and getting them familiar with some key um, safe cycle routes to and from campus from the heavy um, residential areas of student population in, in, in the area. They also wanted to get students understanding their, their local area from, from early days when they arrived on campus. So where are the good eateries? Where are the, the fun places to hang out? Where are the organisations that are really keen to be providing services um, for students that align with students' values. So they, they developed um, a, a route, they looked at, um, I think they went to 10 different eateries, which is quite a big food tour, I would say. Um, and they approached each of those um, organisations. Some of them provided um, free food and drinks. In some cases it was bought, so they bought kind of sharing platters um, for the participants. They communicated this to the student community. They had people at the start point to help people register with the, with the local doctor's bike scheme. So you can see the majority of people here are on um, higher bikes. And then they split into groups of fast, confident riders and slower, um, less confident riders to go on a tour um, of those eateries in the local community. Some people, um, this was a completely new experience, both in terms of where they went, but also the, the distance they rode. So some people rode 13 miles by the end of the day, and a lot of people cited that was the furthest they had ever ridden on a bicycle. But because it was split up, because it was guided, because they were using um, pre-planned routes, um, people found that really interesting. So this is something that the Students Union led on, and they're very keen to replicate and um, upscale, upscale um, in, in future years. Jack, is there anything else you want to talk about with Bristol Bikes? Have I done it justice? Um, yeah, no, you've done it justice. I mean, it was a fantastic event. The driving force behind this was um, the sports participation officer at the Students' Union um, who led on it. And she really, really loved it because it was a great opportunity to engage people who weren't necessarily conventionally sporty types. And she found she was able to kind of advertise this to a sli slightly different demographic from a lot of her other work. Um, she has scheduled a, a repeat ride that's actually for staff, um, which was going to take place recently, but we had uh, torrential rain in Bristol, so that's been postponed, but it's happening soon. Um, one of the bonuses of this, obviously, is that it links people up to a, the local bike share scheme and enabled them to work out how to use it. I love Dockless Bike Share Schemes. We work with them in a lot of our project areas. Doing 13 miles on a Yo bike is very, very impressive. Um, but one of the things that Charlotte touched on as well that's come up repeatedly with the institutions we've worked with is that often people are unaware of really good cycling infrastructure that's right on their doorstep. Um, this was a particular issue at UWE where there's a fabulous um, segregated cycleway all the way into the city centre, but it's kind of tucked away at the back of the campus and lots of people just never come across it. So this ride was a great way to get people out there um, using that infrastructure so that they know where it is for future reference. Uh, they've been shown how to access a, a Yo bike, so hopefully they can cycle independently after this. Um, our follow-up surveys with them will, will show what the lasting behavior change impact was um, of the ride, but it looked like a great day out. Absolutely, thanks Jack. Um, the next intervention we wanted to talk about was, you can do it. There we go. Um, the University of Brighton and their students union. So they um, have multiple campuses that are spread out across um, the Brighton area and have struggled um, specifically with student cycling historically because of the nature of the, um, the through routes between those campuses and also um, the hills is cited as um, quite an off-putting um, thing for students. So they've done some very traditional um, uh, intervention to just try and get people to start thinking about cycling, giving it a go um, and getting some support and getting their bike um, roadworthy. So they did two things. They did um, bicycle breakfasts and bike doctors across each of their campuses. They were really keen to make sure that each of their campuses was getting the same level uh, of, um, of support. And they um, did some promotion beforehand, but the main way they promoted this was by camping out early in the morning at each of the major cycle storage areas uh, on campus. So um, 
opening their, their um, interventions, not just to new cyclists, but recognizing and finding who the existing cyclists were. So free, free bike breakfasts um, for staff and students, but also a doctor bike who's set up in a really prominent central place at each of those five campuses, so that students could get, um, get their bikes checked, but also learn some basic maintenance skills. Um, some key learnings for them um, that they wanted us to share with you was that they worked with their commercial services um, function um, beforehand. So they did their breakfast on a voucher scheme. And this allowed them to um, avoid any food waste, so they weren't over catering or under catering. Um, but it also meant that um, any vouchers that weren't used, they could retain and use for, for later. They prevented it worked out to be quite cost effective as well. And they promoted this via, via social media and through their, their normal student communication channel. Um, and they're really happy with how it's gone, despite the weather that we've had at some of the, um, at some of the events uh, this year. Jack, anything that you can add there? Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about bike breakfasts and Dr. Bikes to a degree is that obviously they're kind of aimed at people who are already cycling in. But I think one of the great things about um, what Lucy, who you see, see there at the top left, um, did with Brighton was to make sure that they were in really public locations. Um, and the idea was that people arriving by other modes um, would see cycling being kind of celebrated and rewarded and people who rode in receiving really good support and services and a free breakfast um, for, for riding in. So the bike breakfast is like, it's, in fact, it's so crucial to what we do that we've worked with a partner to develop a kind of boxed bike breakfast that people can order online so they can put one on with low or no effort because it's so important to have that kind of focal social point for, for people when they ride in. It's also a great opportunity to um, get people like your bicycle user group on site. Um, we always say that the easiest way to someone's heart is uh, through their belly and <laughs> that's certainly the case with the box bike breakfast. And, and, and these sorts of events. So it's, it's just a really good way to celebrate cycling. And um, as Charlotte alluded to, we did have terrible weather um, during March. And um, so it, it was, yeah, extra specially well deserved from people who rode in through ice and snow and sideways rain. Absolutely. I've just realised uh, whilst you were speaking, Jack, that three out of the four case studies have a food theme. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> As a cyclist myself, I know that the two are very closely aligned. Indeed, yeah. indeed. <laughs> Everything that you've just said um, feeds really nicely into the next um, case study, which is actually very similar to what Brighton did. But um, the University of Oxford, um, when I first came to the Unicycle Programme, I was quite surprised that they um, wanted to be a participant because I've never lived in Oxford, but I know that they are recognized for the level of cycling they have um, amongst their community. I now know that um, they really wanted to do two things. One was promote cycling amongst staff. So student cycling at Oxford is very, very high, less so amongst the staff community. But also um, a lot of their interventions today have been looking at new cyclists. How do we entice new people to cycling? But they didn't have that community um, across cyclists that Jack was talking about. So they too went for um, a food-based intervention. So you can see here on the right, um, the doctor bike um, at um, the Radcliffe camera um, working through the snow in March. So I think we should um, give them a little round of applause for their commitment, um, working through the beast where some people uh, postponed their events. But they did two things. One was um, bike breakfast and bike, um, bike breakfasts for um, staff. Now, they, um, I wouldn't say did anything beyond regular communications for this, so they, they framed it really well, but they used their social media channels, their staff communication channels centrally at the university, as well as through the sustainability team. But they had over 200 people at their first bike breakfast, which I think everybody was absolutely blown away by in terms of the, the level of support that they had. And again, it was because it was about this community building um, and, and recognising the existing uh, cyclists, but also being then able to use those existing cyclists to champion cycling, but also to normalise that behaviour. So by exemplifying that, um, that that 200 strong staff community existed, that in itself is a good way of enticing uh, new people in the future. They also ran um, student uh, coffee and cake um, sessions for cyclists. So anybody that could creatively prove that they had cycled um, to the event um, was, was given free tea and cake. And they also did some centrally um, coordinated uh, doctor bike sessions. So historically, a lot of the doctor bike sessions at Oxford have been um, organized by the colleges. So again, that's quite culturally specific to 
to Oxbridge and a few others, but they decided to do some absolutely geographically central Dr. Bright provision that was open to students and staff from all colleges to try and enhance their use. And again, that's proved incredibly popular and something that they're looking at continuing and doing. And adding to that by also um, training up students with their own uh, mechanics skills. So you're not relying on an external partner necessarily to do basic maintenance, such as um, puncture repairs, um, brake adjustments, that sort of thing. So again, looking at exactly the cultural um, elements of Oxford, looking at exactly what they were trying to achieve and what was stopping people from getting involved, they've been able to adjust how they've communicated their interventions to, to reach the audience that they want to reach. And then the final case study that we have for you today is by the University of Worcester and their students' unions, who this, um, earlier this year launched Woo Bikes, which is just a lovely one, um, which is uh, in a 50 feet um, of e-bikes um, that is uh, hosted at the university, but also across Worcester. So this was developed in partnership with the local authority, but also GTEC, who are a, a, um, a bicycle manufacturing firm, to provide these, um, these bikes for staff and students. So here you can see some pictures from the launch event. Um, the gentleman at the bottom is the Vice Chancellor of the University giving um, Woo Bikes a go. Jack, I believe you were there. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about, about the, the launch and how this um, initiative came about and where it's going next? Absolutely, yeah. I was there at the launch. It was a beautiful day, as you can tell, but it was absolutely freezing. Um, the Woo Bikes is a really, really interesting partnership um, Katie, who I'm sure many of you will, will know, she's very active through the AUC, has been the, the driving force behind this. Um, but it's in partnership with the local enterprise partnership with the city council and the county council. Um, GTEC, who provide the bikes, are a local firm. Um, so it's really a kind of uh, an effort between a lot of allies locally to make that, um, that, that fleet off the, get that fleet off the ground. They're really fantastic bikes. They certainly do an awful lot. I'm sure in, in many places where, where um, attendees are, there's more and more e-bikes on the street. We're seeing that all over the place. Certainly in Worcester, which is definitely a very car-centric city, um, having these e-bikes is providing a real alternative mode to people. Um, it's been very difficult to kind of administer the scheme and get it all set up. But I believe they're starting to get really good uptake on this. Um, it's... A bit different to lots of bike share schemes um, that are at other campuses. I know um, Warwick have a docked one through Next Bike. Other cities have dockless schemes, but this one is administered through the uni. So it's through people's staff cards and student cards that they can access the bikes. Um, I can't remember the cost off the top of my head, but they're a very modest price to, to pay for a, a membership. Um, and they're brilliant. I mean, if you haven't had a go on an e-bike yet, it's a real insight into what Lance Armstrong felt like um, when he was being a naughty boy. But it's, it's uh, great fun and it's a, a wonderful way to get around. And obviously one of the strengths of the Unicycle program is that where you, universities are working on schemes like this, um, we can market it to people effectively and also incentivize people to take it up because we offer great prizes and incentives um, to people who take part in our program. So it's a really good way to signpost a really good service um, and, and encourage people to take it up and use it. I suppose at this point I should also do a little plug for the uh, EAUC conference next week. So for those of you that are going to be there, there's going to be some Woo Bikes um, that uh, Katie and the team at Worcester have coordinated bringing up. So we'll be able to go for a little ride around Leafy Keel um, if you haven't already um, had a go. So those are our four, four case studies um, today. We're, um, another plug, we're going to be delivering a second uh, Unicycle webinar on the 4th of July and we'll be presenting some further case studies and going into a bit more depth about the challenges people have faced um, and how they've overcome those um, so we can go into a bit more kind of warts and all with some of those. So in terms of impact, as I said at the beginning, we're currently pulling together all of the monitoring and evaluation statistics that we've um, got. Uh, from this year. Um, so we did some, some initial baselining work with some reach statistics and we've also got all of the fabulous um, stats that come from the Love to Ride platform that as um, riders register they tell us about their current riding habits through their use of the platform we can, um, we can monitor how much people are cycling, how regularly they're cycling, how far they're cycling, whether or not they're recommending cycling to other people. So we've got some stats here. Jack, do you want to talk through um, the impact so far that we've seen? Work. Progress. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So these are actually slightly outdated. I haven't taken a new report since bike week started. Um, so these are the numbers from before it. We had almost 2,000 people. It's definitely over that now have logged a trip on the website since we launched last year. Um, as you can see, we've clocked up some really, really impressive miles. There's over a million miles have been ridden and uh, 125,000 trips. Um, that new rider number is obviously really, really important as well. Nearly 500 new riders. They're our key target audience. Um, another um, bonus of those sorts of bike breakfast kind of interventions that we've seen is that that helps with our flow of communications, really. It's very important with Love to Ride programs that we engage people who already ride and we provide them with the platform to encourage their, their colleagues and peers to ride. Um, so that, that encouragement is central to what we do and the new rider figure is how we measure our success in that direction. As you can see, that's a, a decent proportion this year. So we're, we're very pleased for a pilot year to have achieved that. Um, in terms of the, the impact in creating project teams at university, one of the things that's been really interesting has been to see connections formed between the kind of operational side, the estates and facilities management, um, researchers at universities who are active either in cycling or related fields such as public health, um, and with student groups and, and external stakeholders. And in some places that's really taken shape very, very nicely. Um, Oxford actually donated their prize money to um, a local cycling co-op called Broken Spoke, who they've been working really closely with and the project has helped to kind of solidify their working relationship. Um, so that's something that we're really keen to push in the, the next academic year is to work with participating universities to cultivate those relationships and to, to really work with all the stakeholders internally and externally to, to push cycling. Um, the, the final bullet point here is just that we've trialled a variety of events. The case studies have given you a, a taste of the kinds of things that people have been doing. Unfortunately, because they're busy and or cycling, um, a lot of the student-led projects we haven't had case studies back for yet. Um, so a couple of those, for instance, have been the cycling club at the University of Sheffield have run a few engagement events. Um, they've had Love to Ride prizes for some of their race meets and used their networks to promote what we're doing. They were the highest placed student team, so they really took a lead on that and have done very well. We've also had a few um, projects with students getting bike maintenance training so that they can do peer-to-peer -peer support to, to basically come up with a sort of positive feedback loop where we have people getting involved with external partners through accessing cycle maintenance training. They're then able to help their peers to continue to cycle. They've also forged that link so that newcomers, other students can be directed towards that kind of adult cycle training and bike maintenance training um, and, and hence kind of normalize cycling and skill students up to cycle in a self-sufficient way on a sustainable basis. Um, so they're the, the big impacts for me of, of the program, I think. Oh, thanks, Jack. Um, so a little bit about some of the things that we've learned over the course of the year. Um, obviously, this has been a pilot we're learning um, through doing, and we're really delighted that we've been able to see impact over that over that learning process. Um, there's definitely things that we're going to be doing differently uh, over the course of the next year as the programme continues to develop. So the first thing that we've learned is absolutely necessary to start early. So now is the right time to be planning your interventions and your, your activities for, for the next academic year, especially from the student community. So much um, relies on early habit formation. One of um, the key theories of change that NUS uses for a lot of our behaviour change engagement work is the habit discontinuity theory. And that basically um, states that when people are going through a change in their lifetime, if they adapt new habits at that change, then they will continue um, with far more um, longevity and strength than if you try and retrospectively change your habits. So for example, if a student's coming to a new city, to a new campus, to, to have a new routine in their life through, through becoming a, a student, if at that stage they create new habits, they will stick much better than if eight months along the line and they, those habits are already formed and trying to encourage them to, to adapt to new ones. So starting early is really key. So convening your working group, getting those different stakeholders on campus, thinking about what can be done early days to, to normalise students, to engage them with this agenda, 
to bring staff together is really key. Um, because there's so many stakeholders within a university that have um, an interest in this area, it's also really important to ensure that there's ownership for this project. So we found that although it's really, really beneficial to bring together a wide diversity of people, that making sure that there is clear leadership within that um, and ownership is really important to make sure that the change happens in a timely fashion and that um, momentum is maintained. Um, Jack's already done um, a great job of outlining kind of the, the benefits of building that community of allies and aligning with other initiatives. One of the things that we've done um, through um, NUS's other behaviour change programmes is looking at how we can integrate the unicycle message into green impact, into student switch off, um, into curriculum reform work that we're doing. So looking at where the opportunities are to rather than doing things from scratch and reinventing the wheel, um, looking at how we can build, build um, cycling practices into existing initiatives that we're seeing. Providing incentives, so whether that's um, you know a croissant and a cup of tea in the morning, or whether that's um, the prize of a, a trip to San Francisco through being uh, one of Lucky Rides uh, individuals, there's a whole host of incentives that we've provided to encourage people to get involved. If it's once, if it's as a regular user, um, so that there's awareness of what's going on, and really empower students. So we haven't had a case study about this today, but we will do in the next um, webinar. But looking at how. Some universities have really worked with their students and their student bodies to, to make sure that they're leading and driving um, um, learning about um, behaviour change whilst um, really leading the Unicycle programme on campus and um, has been really impactful, not just in terms of the Unicycle programme's impact, but on those students as well. So um, going back to how we um, engage students with the sustainability agenda, how we upskill them and make sure that they, they leave their education with the skills, the knowledge, the passion, the values, the attributes to become sustainability change makers, we're looking at how we can um, enhance that through the program next year as well. So Sophie said that there'd be some time for Q&A uh, in the session, now is that time. Um, so yeah, does anybody have any questions, any comments, any, uh, any anything that they'd like to add? Uh, be really good. So yeah, as Charlotte said, does anybody have any questions? You can pop it in the chat box, um, particularly if you would like to get involved with uh, the programme next year, if your institution wasn't involved this year. Um, if you have any questions, if you're coming to the conference, if you'd like to talk to Charlotte and Jack in person, um, we do actually have a workshop, which is workshop 15 on the Wednesday of next week uh, between four and five. So if you'd like to come along to that, you can find out a bit more. Um, as I said, please utilise the chat box or if you just raise your hand or, or just uh, pop on. Um, does anyone have any questions? Most people are typing or putting their hands up uh, remotely. I should just do a big thumbs up, a big um, thank you to the pilot participants that we've had this year. So I just wanted to recognise um, the University of the West of England and their students union, the University of Exeter and their students union, the University of Brighton and their students union, uh, the University of Worcester and their students union. University of Sheffield and their students union, um, the University of Leicester um, and their students union, and then the two non-funded institutions, the University of Kingston and the University of Oxford and their respective students unions as well. We really couldn't have done any of this without their input um, and their, their honest engagement. So some have been more engaged than others, more have found this more challenging than others, but we're really delighted to have them on board and look forward to continue to work with them in the future. So big hands up to them. Thank you very much for that. Well, I haven't got any questions coming through because I actually think your presentation was so comprehensive, Charlotte and Jack, that actually answered a lot of questions as you kind of went through, which was excellent. Um, and I'm sure everyone will agree it was incredibly informative. So thank you all so much for putting that together. Um, as Charlotte mentioned, we've got the second in our webinars, um, which will be on the 4th of July, same time, so 11.30 to 12.30. And that webinar will go into a little bit more depth about the learnings of the, prop, of the pilot, um, what people have struggled with, how ISM and the Unicycle programme can help you overcome challenges, what's new for year two, um, and as, as I mentioned, further case studies from the pilot participants. Um, so you'll be able to leave that case study and that webinar with top tips and inspiration to take to your campus and the opportunity to get involved with year two, which will obviously follow on from everything happening at our conference next week. Um, if you're unable to attend the conference, everything will be available on our website afterwards. So um, 
if you can't come don't feel like you're going to miss out or or you know if, if you wanted to have the information it is going to be available for you online um, and I think that's pretty much everything from me just want to say a big thank you to Charlotte and Jack for putting that together um, very much thank looking you. forward to seeing you next week and having a go on the Woo Bikes and as I'm sure everyone else who's coming to conference would like to have a go at whizzing about on it um, mm -hmm. if anyone does have any questions sort of they think of something following the webinar please just ping me an email I will send an email around with the link to the video so you can share it amongst your colleagues and I'll ensure that that gets back to Charlotte and Jack so um, I think that's everything then from us so just a big thank you to you both uh, see you next week and um, thank you again thanks everyone for okay, thank, you. thank you very bye much bye. folks have a good bye one bye, bye. bye.